Okay, guys, thank you for joining us here for another uh, Ask Me Anything event. Uh, I, um, I'm just getting started about a minute early, so uh, there'll probably be a little bit of a lag time before people get on and uh, have a little different camera angle on the side, but I'll get back to a regular camera here. Uh, we'll switch camera views here. That'll probably be a little bit more, a little less disorienting for people. Uh, so if you're just joining me for the first time, or this is your first one, my name is Glenn Morgan. I'm with We The Governed, and this is a Ask Me Anything uh, event. And uh, it's a live stream, and you can go ahead and type in the questions that you might have, and I will get to them here. If you can, try to make sure you hit in the, um, you write at uh, We The Governed, just so it's easier for me to see it as a question and not just a, a comment that, uh, that you might be making about to somebody else or or with somebody else. The uh, other thing I want to mention, and I've tried to do this a little bit more consistently by request, is just kind of explain uh, to anybody who's logging on to some different places that I'll be at or speaking at. Um, for those of you who were in Moses Lake this Saturday, um, it was good to meet you. Uh, it, was a, it was a good event out there and uh, had a chance to speak there. And of course, there were a lot of other politicians and uh, candidates that were running for office. I really liked the fact that uh, the Grant County Republicans had some local Moses Lake uh, City Council candidates. I really enjoyed getting a chance to meet them and uh, just seeing some of the other people that were there, that was, that was really fun. And uh, so I'm always honored to be invited to speak at events like that and get a chance to meet a lot of other people. I saw a lot of people there signing the uh, six initiatives that are out right now. And, uh, and of course that process seems to be moving along really, really well. Uh, probably one of the most successful uh, conservative oriented signature gathering processes that the state's ever seen. So uh, it's really, it was great to see a lot of people out there and uh, it was a good opportunity to be in Eastern Washington again and talk to a lot of my friends. Um, one thing I was gonna make a comment on is that uh, for this next week, on Saturday, I'm expecting to be, I believe, up in the Port Townsend area. There's um, an event there in the afternoon, and uh, I think it's called the Boy Scout Cabin. I'll be up there from 11 o'clock uh, onward, and I'll be speaking and meeting a bunch of my friends out in Jefferson County. And so that'll be kind of fun to just hear what you're up to, get a chance to meet some people out there. Um, for those who are interested, and I just want to make sure I kind of reemphasize this, I know I'm doing some campus events later on this year where I'll be speaking at uh, actually both high schools and um, college campuses. And so if you're interested in having me do that, just make sure you reach out uh, to me at We The Governor. You can reach out my website or um, just send me a message or an email, glenn at We The Governed, which is G-L-E-N at We The Governed. Send me a message and uh, just let me know so I can work out logistics and kind of get it into the calendar. I always like speaking to students and I like interacting uh, with students as much as possible. So um, any of events like that that might be out there uh, in the future, I would definitely want to make sure that I um, uh, get that on the calendar and kind of schedule it in advance. Um, not this coming up weekend, but the following weekend, I know uh, that Friday I'm going to be out in Chelan at, uh, in uh, Manson, and I'll be doing a, a, a speaking engagement out there. I believe that's with the Republican Women's Club. There's a couple of Republican Women's Clubs, so I don't want to insult anybody and get the wrong club here, but I'm speaking out in Manson um, that day, and I have to drive uh, as soon as I'm done there, it'll be a lunch event that Friday, and then I'm driving all the way out to Anacortes to catch a ferry to San Juan Islands, and I'll be doing some, uh, both a presentation and some training out in the uh, San Juan County. So, love going out to the islands. I've been going out there since I was a kid, and uh, it's always fun to be up in the San Juans. There's a lot of great people out there doing good stuff, trying to... Uh, restore some level of sanity out there in the islands where there's a, a lot of lefties and kind of elitists that like to kind of run the islands, but it's uh, really good. So um, anyway, that's that's kind of an important um, update. I know a lot of people like to hear some of those um, about some of those events next Tuesday as well. So don't forget about this a week from today. Um, I'm going to be at Todd Herman's event up in Bothell um, and uh, I, I don't remember the name of the event right now, but Todd Herman's doing a big event up there, and so I know I'm going to be speaking at that event as well, and uh, probably have a table there if you want to meet me at that event up in Snohomish County. So it's always good to see people. Please make a point of coming up and talking to me. If um, you see me out in public, I'm really honored 
to be meeting people that, that watch my video, especially if you watch my live streams. Uh, and uh, it's always fun to see people in public. Just late last night, I was driving and I stopped at a gas station to uh, fill up with gas, late night drive. Uh, and uh, when I stopped, the, the guy behind me just happened to be somebody who knew, had watched my videos. And so I had just a great conversation just randomly at a pilot gas station in uh, Tumwater, Washington. So it's really fun to meet people out there in public who do watch my channel and watch my videos. And, uh, and I feel pretty honored to, to meet people like that out there. Now, as I've mentioned to people before, I recorded three videos uh, today uh, that'll kind of launch over the next week. Hopefully, one of them will launch tomorrow. As best, I'm hoping that I get one, get it up and ready tomorrow, and uh, possibly one on uh, Thursday, and maybe one on Saturday if I'm lucky enough. And most, it's funny. Normally, uh, I'm doing just a lot of real original videos, but uh, because of some of the stories that we've put out, they just keep evolving and changing. Uh, all three of these videos that I recorded today really are just an update on some recent video stories that we've done. One of them is on the election story out of King County uh, because um, uh, Jim Walsh, who's the Republican uh, Party chair, the recently elected Republican Party chair, has jumped in and officially responded to uh, Julie Weiss, the King County elections director, kind of their non-answer answer, answer uh, about the weirdness at the King County Elections Office in um, the primary election, just the strange stuff that's been going on there. And if you've watched some of my re recent videos, and again, you can only explain so much when you're when you're doing a short video like this. But I mean, basically, this this weird secret server swap that the uh, King County Elections did, and you know, without telling anybody. And then once uh, one of one election observer knows there was something wrong, and started to do records requests. So once it became apparent that people were going to figure out what was going on, then she finally let the King County Republicans know that she had done the secret server swap right in the middle of the election process in July. And so by the time she let them know, it was like a week after the election date was over. I mean, they're still counting ballots, but it's essentially done. No observers were brought to observe what they did. No, nobody saw that they actually did an LNA test. Um, and conveniently, the video cameras got Epstein during that time, so they weren't working. Only then, right? Those are the only cameras, just those. Those went down, couldn't, no, those wouldn't work. So, uh, and now she's lawyering up and trying to run out the clock, probably to shred as much data as she can. Uh, the AG's office is kind of engaged with her. The Secretary of State has as well. So uh, anyway, a lot of drama related to that. So I just wanted to kind of give an update on where that story was. There is something, you know, one of the, a little secret, you know, recommendation that I would have if you're running government. If you want to, you know, if you're not hiding anything, then just stop hiding things. You know, that would pretty much solve a lot of the questions and problems. If you want election conspiracies to exist, then just keep behaving the way that you do in King County. Hide everything, redact everything, make it as untransparent as possible, keep it secret, lie, mislead, try to uh, say that you don't need to provide any of the information or evidence to show that you weren't uh, screwing up the elections. That's a great way to convince people uh, that, that, that if you just are more transparent, then um, you're, that's a great way to convince people at least that you're not as corrupt as you appear to be when you're trying to hide everything. So anyway, that was a good story. The other one I did a follow up on, Bob Ferguson's office has been very angry about the video that I did last week about the uh, Sex Offender Review Board um, lack of pushback really from the Attorney General's office in Washington State. And the nature of the story really had to do that. I did the video last week um, where I was showing how Bob Ferguson didn't sign the National Association of, Gov of Attorney Generals. They had sent this letter in with 37 signatories that had really strongly worded. It was very detailed, and it pushed back on these crazy re uh, policy changes that were being recommended by this leftist group to make it so that sex offenders could be released secretly, not notify the people in the communities that they were released into, um, uh, lighter sentences, all kinds of other issues that they were trying to restrict with these proposals. And this board was reviewing those proposals. That doesn't mean they were accepting them. It just means they were reviewing them before they got any further. And so the Bob Ferguson was one of the few AGs that didn't sign that letter. And so I pointed that out. And Ari Hoffman, uh, 570 AM uh, uh, up in KVI up in Seattle, had done a radio interview with me. And I was talking about that and that whole story. And so he was that that 
uh, that story got out there. It got uh, his show uh, got a lot of coverage from that. It went up on the Post Millennial as well. And um, Ferguson apparently was upset with my quote where I said when the attorney general's office isn't shredding documents, right, or concealing them from the public, they're out uh, uh, releasing violent sex predators and trying to make it easier to release them. And so they didn't like that. And so one of the arguments that the AG's paid uh, public information officers had, they wanted uh, Ari Hoffman to change his reporting. And so they said, well, he did sign on that letter, but I've, we got a copy of it. His, he clearly didn't sign it. And so Ari Hoffman had forwarded that to him and said, listen, he didn't sign this, this letter. It, it's right here. And his, his, the attorney general did not sign it. So they sent a different letter that he did sign later at a different time. So he didn't sign on to that one. He apparently signed on to a later one, that, that he being Bob Ferguson, signed on to this later one. But it was basically a um, lot it was watered down version of the first one. So that's kind of what's going on there right now. And uh, so for those of you who just joined in on the video, we're just talking about a couple of the videos that I did uh, today, filmed today, that'll probably be launching this week. So I essentially took um, a, just an update of Bob Ferguson's office in damage control mode, um, trying to pretend that he um, is not actually the violent sex predator's best friend in Washington State but that his, that he actually care, somehow doesn't actually want violent sex predators to be everywhere, even though all of his actions indicate otherwise. So we'll see where that story goes. Uh, the one thing I kind of outlined in the video that I just did about him too, I think this is important, is that uh, while his office has been mired in some unusual scandals that we don't typically see in an attorney general's office, one of them has been this uh, repetitive destruction of public records or attempt to conceal them. It isn't that we haven't caught many times state agencies or local government officials uh, trying to conceal public records. That that does happen. Um, but the attorney general's office has generally not been in the center of those scandals and destroying records themselves. And that has changed with Bob Ferguson in there, uh, the Oso oh landslide story where his office specifically got involved in the willfully destroyed or allowed to be destroyed a bunch of public records that were quite relevant and never recovered in regards to the original Oso landslide um, situation, which was a big deal. Um, the most recent uh, and more egregious case recently has been the activity of the AG's office to basically hide these records, uh, destroy a bunch of records or attempt to hide them, um, as it related to the care for this disabled lady uh, for, under DSHS, uh, Department of Social Health Services. Um, who was a disabled um, lady that they were watching and uh, or, su or supposedly they had care over this lady and of course um, they were negligent. Um, not an uncommon situation that happens all the time with the state. What is uncommon is that the state was caught, specifically the Attorney General, um, employees were caught basically destroying and hiding records from uh, the litigation that this lady was involved in with the state and in an effort to conceal how bad the state actually is. This is a good story in the sense of cover-ups always worse than the crime, uh, and uh, the AG's office is direct, directly implicated in the destruction of records or attempting to conceal these records from the public. And so um, that's been public recently. There was a $200,000 fine assessed against the AG's office with another $122,000 fine on top of that. So um, clearly bad behavior. Um, and so I am actually unaware of the, any attorney general ever in the history of the state of Washington since at least the Public Records Act was created in 1972 that's been as involved as Bob Ferguson's been involved in the destruction of public records. His office actually holds first place position when it comes to AG who's destroyed or supervised the destruction of more public records and try to hide them from the public. It really makes you wonder is how much how many other records he's been active in concealing or hiding from the public, and it's probably quite a few, unfortunately. So uh, between the active involvement that his office has been in, in watering down and releasing, the, watering down the restrictions on violent sex predators, uh, or actively engaged in trying to assist in reducing the, the like, uh, taking a level three sex offender and pretending like they're a level two and then releasing them and not notifying community members like they did in, in Cleallum, or not Cleallum, but Enumclaw, and in King County and all over the state. Uh, and so his office is directly implicated in all this stuff. And so uh, now he's trying to pretend like he's not the sex predator, violent sex predator's best friend. And he doesn't like that because it probably doesn't pull well even in Seattle, probably that doesn't pull well. So he's trying to pretend now that he cares about public safety, even though he's indicated, he's never provided any indication with his actions that he cares about public safety at all. What he does care about, of course, is 
uh, Bob Ferguson we're speaking about now. What Bob Ferguson does care about, of course, is um, applying the law aggressively, uh, whatever law you can find, to go after his public uh, uh, political enemies. So it's not just all the lawsuits against Trump, which were just frivolous fundraising exercises on his part, but also attacking Tim Iman or like this judge in Grant County that he didn't like because the judge was, is a retired judge who was involved in helping, um, uh, who was opposed to a prosecutor candidate out there that was one of Bob Ferguson's friends. So he had, he being Bob Ferguson, had genuinely gone after this guy pretty aggressively. So anyway, a lot of that stuff's going on out there, um, and it's worth exposing. And I also did an update on the Yakima mayor uh, video, which has got a lot of traction that I produced a while ago, where I played that 911 call that she made trying to uh, call the police on signature gathers. And so um, I did an update on that because uh, that video clearly demonstrated that the mayor of Yakima was using her personal phone to conduct public business, and therefore people were filing records requests to find exactly how much personal public business was she doing on her personal phone. And then, of course, now she's destroyed her phone or trying to shut it down or trying to conceal the records. So um, that drama is going on. Of course, she's not. Even if there are records that they're going to give, they're going to wait until a week after the election in November, of course, because not that she's up for election. Election, but some of her friends who've um, prevented her from being censored on the uh, when they do the censor vote on the Yakima City Council, it was a four to three vote. So three people said that she should be censored, four said no, and some of those ones who said no are actually up for election. So um, the cover up or what's involved in it is probably in affecting how that public records response goes. Um, there's a question here from Sean John uh, Eleven. Any thoughts on the Speaker of the House being ousted? Thank you for what you do, uh, Sean and Bothell. Well, uh, listen, I have no idea for sure what's going on in D.C. There's so many games that are played back in D.C. I, I really, and so many cult of personalities and so many um, counter narratives. And even on our, even on the conservative side, whatever that really means when you're in Washington, D.C., um, I don't know for sure what this battle's going on. Um, I, I've heard and this is kind of what I believe. I always look at these activities and I think, well, what, what on the, what's out, what's the outcome here that's going to promote liberty and freedom? Can we, I mean, a lot of this is a budget-based argument originally. Clearly right now, anybody who believes that math is real uh, knows that um, we're on an unsustainable path right now at an escalating level where the country can't possibly uh, handle the expenditures. We, I don't think we can even pay what we're already in debt. Uh, you know, $33 trillion in debt plus whatever they just keep spending. So at some point in time, some adult or group of adults have to come together and resolve this issue. Um, and it won't be pretty. It's going to be ugly. And this continuing resolution to just keep the government open for another month, all the drama around it, I don't see them getting much in the way of um, uh, any value out of what they're doing right now. So... Um, this, and then these backroom deals and kickback schemes and agreements with the Democrats, all the stuff that's going on, it's really hard to sort out from that what the best and optimal way to proceed is. And so I just don't really know what's going on back there. Um, Bobby, you have a question here. Do you pay for the venues you speak at or are you mostly invited? Uh, good question. I'm actually mostly invited. Um, most of the time people will invite me to come speak. Sometimes... Um, I'll organize training events where I'm training activists uh, very specifically on maybe how to use a Public Records Act better, or how to use a Public Disclosure Commission website better, or just how to organize um, like a local watchdog group to watch your government. And um, there's uh, there's a lot of um, those types of venues. Sometimes they're relatively small. They'll be, they'll be at somebody's house or um, a restaurant or um, maybe a, a library or someplace like that. And so usually those don't really cost anything. Um, I don't, I very rarely get involved in um, paying for a room, set up a venue where you come to the venue that I'm speaking at. Um, I probably should do more of those. Um, it's been something I've been talking with some other people about, but mostly I'm invited to events that already exist and then I go there and help with them. So, um, Hawk fan, you, um, not a question, but you're thanking me for the work. Thank, that's always appreciated. Uh, your grandparents um, host at a lake campground out there about one mile outside Manson. Yeah, my, my, uh, one of my grandparents, uh, my grandfather on my mom's side, actually uh, lived in Manson uh, for his last few years before he passed away. And so I spent a lot of time out there, actually, over the years. 
Uh, I'm looking to come out, looking forward to being out there again. So that should be good. Uh, Jason, you got a question, uh, thoughts on the Trump trial in New York and the judge smirking at the camera and the AG looking at Trump with rage. Okay, this is classic. And obviously there, there's a hundred other people, a thousand other people out there, if anything, that are, that are making comments on the Trump trial and the smirking judge and the corrupt um, eight, uh, prosecutor attorney out there. Uh, those kind of, I mean, uh, for those of you who haven't been in court before, maybe it surprises you that the judges are corrupt uh, or politically biased. And I think the problem is that, you know, we have this image of going to the courts and being treated fairly. Like, you may not always like the result, but essentially you go in, there's rules, there's a framework of rules that you go through and you argue uh, your side or the other side, and whoever does the better job is going to come out on, you know, you're going to resolve the, the case. I've been in court a lot. And uh, I think that that's probably true if you have a traffic ticket or something that's relatively minor and mundane that the judges just process by the volume, right? I think you'll probably get a fairly honest hearing in those cases. Uh, probably most of the time if you're trying to get it, uh, I know I've had to get a restraining order against people threatening to kill me before. And so, you know, that process is fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. I don't think it, it's um, super biased most of the time. Where it really becomes difficult and where the, the judicial system fails right now, particularly in, in America, in most places, and this is just an extreme example, people are seeing at a national level, is when the judge is very clearly biased, like extremely biased, and they're pulling out all the stops in some nasty way uh, to attack somebody from a very political standpoint. If you had sat through, I actually went to um, several, I've been to several cases that weren't, where I wasn't even being sued or in court myself, but I've sat in court on other cases. The Tim Iman case, for example, several times I sat in on his cases or during his lawsuits. And sometimes you can just see a radical bias in the judges. They, they're just incredibly biased. They're, they're, um, they, there's no way they're going to be honest or give equal weight to either side. Now, sometimes if you're fighting, of course, a lot of the cases I'm involved in or interested in, those involve uh, pushing back against government which means it's you versus the state. And there's great deference that nearly every judge has uh, in America, almost every judge. Very rarely will you find a judge that doesn't have great deference to the state. So all things being equal, if you provide the same amount of evidence and the state provides the same amount of uh, evidence and it's equal, they'll always weight the state heavier and rule against you almost every time. In civil cases or in, in constitutional cases, they'll, just, they'll, they'll do that out of habit. Um, people who have been watching the Supreme Court are aware that this particular cycle, there's a lot of Chevron, right, right, which was this early 1980s case that kind of created this um, idea in the court system that the judges would give greater weight because theoretically the bureaucrats in the state, they have uh, a neutral, you know, neutral perspective on things. But of course, that's not true. If you've ever been involved with government, you know that they're more biased than most people with a self-serving objective and goal to, to be uh, dishonest in their own way. And so I think we're seeing some pushback against at the federal level, but at the local level, I actually think it's way worse. And uh, so there's some judges, like Judge Dixon in uh, Tim Iman's case. Um, Judge Dixon, there was no scenario where that guy would ever rule against the state. He just wouldn't. Uh, he was a former FBI guy. He, um, he wasn't the worst judge. I, mean, I sat in on cases where I thought he ruled okay, but if it was you against the state, you always lost. It didn't matter what the state did or how bad they acted or how bad they behaved, you almost always lost. And uh, the only, there were times he had good rulings, but it was only because the state, like there was a case in 1639, which was the um, assault weapons, uh, the, the, the initiative that Nick Hanauer and, these bill and Bloomberg and these billionaires funded in our state to attack semi-automatic firearms. And they had totally screwed up. I did the ballot title challenge against it, which delayed the launch of that initiative process by about a month. So it cost them a couple million dollars more than they were expecting, which they were pretty pissed off at me about at the time. And then about halfway through their signature gathering, I realized that, uh, and it wasn't just me, it was several other people, we caught the fact that they hadn't correctly updated the back of the initiative with the changes, the correct language on it. It was actually incorrect, which is an explicit violation of the statute. And so that was a challenge that was brought against that initiative um, once it was submitted. And, and they were notified, they didn't change. And so we, we brought the challenge, went to court, and we were before Judge Dixon. At the time, Kim Wyman was Secretary of State. So Kim Wyman 
uh, came in, her, her office came in and argued uh, on the same side that we did, which is the, sta the statute's very clear, and these guys um, didn't follow the law, and therefore the initiative should be voided because they collected signatures and all their initiatives with uh, completely inaccurate information on the back. Plus, it was so small, nobody could read it. There was no way to actually read what they wrote on the back. It was like below eight-point font. And in fact, the judge couldn't read it. He was trying to read it even with a magnifying glass. It was very difficult. So Judge Dixon in that case ruled correctly, I believe, that, um, that that initiative violated the law. But the reason why he did, in my opinion, is because the Secretary of State's office came in and presented their side, and we happened to be on the same side in that case, uh, we being the pro-Second Amendment people arguing against this. And so therefore, he had a good ruling. And the Second Amendment Foundation was involved in this case. It was a pretty big deal. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, overruled us because um, the Supreme Court knows who they work for, and it's not you or I. The state Supreme Court of Washington clearly work for the political elite, and the billionaires who had funded that initiative were not going to, and included people who supported some of those judges, like Nick Hanauer, again, and Bloomberg, and these other people. There's no way that they were going to let their millions of dollars they had dumped in this initiative go to waste. And so the Supreme Court, without comment or clarity, just simply rejected uh, Dixon's rule. So Judge Dixon could make good rulings, but most of the time my experience with him was that no matter how good your case was, if the state was on the other side, it was terrible. He was about as good as you got in Thurston County. Most of the judges in Thurston County uh, are from the Attorney General's office. That's where they started their career path. Um, if you try to get people who don't have that background to run for judge or consider running for judge, they get threatened. Um, big law firms, if you work at a big law firm, you're going to run for a uh, judge position. They'll, they'll remove you from their firm and have you... They'll, they'll kick you out, so your career path is very difficult. So the judicial system is very much biased against you. This judge in New York is just so blatant with, you know, he's a nobody judge, nobody cares or knew who he was. Now he has an opportunity to be famous. Normally they don't even allow uh, uh, cameras in the courtroom in New York. Of course, they are in this case, and there he is smirking and enjoying the attention. And uh, you know the judge know, and the and the uh, local prosecutor they totally know that the the fix is in against Trump there, and that was just it's just a con game. What's so bad about that actually, particularly if you live in New York, is that it, the message is clearly if you don't politically align with whatever the establishment wants you to align with, that um, they're going to use any excuse they can find in the law and just make something up and take everything you own. That's essentially the argument they're making there, the complete voiding of all property rights. Now, is Trump likely to prevail against this at some point down the road? Probably, but in the meantime, that's tremendous threat against him financially. I mean, if it wasn't for somebody with as many resources as he has, that, that would be a disaster. So um, that this whole case out of New York, it should be pretty scary if you care about property rights. Um, that is a bad situation. It doesn't matter what you, whether you like Trump or not. Um, that's so irrelevant. It, people can't forget Trump and fill in the blank. It doesn't matter who it is. This is clearly a hyper-partisan, incredibly biased weaponization of the legal system and a destruction of the rule of law at such a scale that if it can happen to him, there's nothing that's going to protect you and I from the same thing at some point in time in the future. And I've been on the receiving end of cases like this with corrupt judges before. And it's not a particularly uh, enjoyable experience, and they like to, you know, the left likes to abuse that process to destroy you. That's just how they operate. And that was a scary one. Um, the, there was a question there. Oh, actually, some of these are not questions, so keep going down. Um, Let's see. Jack, thank you for putting me on the same level as Washington Gun Law Channel. Uh, love it. Uh, those guys are great, and particularly in addressing some of the Second Amendment issues. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question here, Jason. You got another question here. What's your thoughts on the Ninth Circuit refusing to strike down the magazine ban and playing strategic games? Well, the Ninth Circuit might do that, but again, my guess is it keeps going up to the Supreme Court on this case. I mean, remember, they've... Um, the Ninth Circuit has shot down several um, gun bill or um, ridiculous gun restrictions, but uh, the Fifth Circuit is where probably most of the gun issues and some of the administrative state issues are kind of coming out of the Fifth Circuit right now. We're just going to have to see. I mean, we we've got a. Um, I think it's very dangerous to put your faith or your future with freedom and liberty in the hands of some judges. It is because I think they can be influenced. I think people can get to them. 
I think that they live in a, in a fairly elite world already, so they aren't as affected by the day-to-day -day activities. It takes a very strong person to stand there and to um, uh, be strong and stick to their guns but which, which is a pun in this case, I guess. But anyway, so stick to their guns, but basically stick to their belief about freedom and liberty and individual rights. It's very hard for them to do that because they get a lot of pressure on them. And uh, so I wouldn't want to have to always rely on the, the judges shooting down dumb political um, decisions that, are, that happen. Right now, what I really see is just this kind of uh, growing crescendo in a quest for power, right? And the... Um, classic kind of leftist movements that you're seeing around you right now, some of it's desperation. Either the left feels like they're about ready to lose something, and so they're very, it's that last push through desperation to try to grab what they hope they can get, or they feel like they've gone far enough that they can just do this last push and then take away all freedom moving forward. So their attacks on property rights, gun ownership, and freedom of speech, censorship, all that stuff, that's really, really part of what um, is very important for us to be aware of right now. And we're living in dangerous times because of that, I think, more than anything else. Um, the uh, Robert, you got a question here. Have you considered interviewing other YouTubers, such as News for Reasonable People, to cross-pollinate or increase your and their reach? Um, yes, I have. Uh, I've actually had some conversations about that with a few others. Um, one of the things that makes my um, channel and website sort of a little different, it's just I do tend to not focus on national issues. Um, frankly, I don't think people care that much about what I have to say about Washington, D.C. or Trump, even though sometimes people ask questions about that here. That's not so much the topic that, um, that I think people would go to my channel for. I do tend to focus on Washington State. I love Washington, fifth generation Washingtonian. I want Washington to become a, um, you know, outpost for freedom and liberty in, in America. And even though uh, places like Seattle seem to make that seem, be very difficult, I still think there's a lot of possibility for Washington to get into a situation where we could be that beacon for freedom and liberty. It takes a lot of work. You have to show up and you can't run away from it. There's no escaping this. Uh, people who think they're going to move to Idaho, um, you're just delaying it by a couple years, maybe, with the experiences that we're having in our state. So what you really need to uh, do is to go out there and um, become more engaged and involved. So, um, but because of that, I tend to be focused on um, doing stuff about Washington State. And there aren't a lot of other YouTubers who do stuff in Washington. There's a lot of, there's a number of talk show hosts. Most of them I'm occasionally on their show uh, and I do stuff with them. Uh, there's a few new, there's a few channels that have been set up. If some of you saw, I was just interviewed by Brandy Cruz and I know that she played that video recently. Um, like I said earlier in the show, I was talking about being on Ari Hoffman's show and being interviewed by him. I've done a lot of, I've done stuff with Todd Herman and others before. I'll try to do more of that stuff. I'm not really so much, I have to admit, I don't tend to think about cross-pollination or trying to expand my reach as much as I probably should. I'm really focused on the content I'm developing and the activism that I'm doing and then reporting on it. So that tends to be a little bit of a different um, sort of angle. And sometimes that's interesting to other people and sometimes it's not. Um, the geographic focus, if you look at this YouTube channel, is nearly all US viewers, no surprise. And then within that, um, about 60% of the people who come and watch the channel are from Washington State. Again, no surprise. Um, the ones who are not are usually from Idaho or Oregon with a few like Montana, I mean, generally fairly local, with pockets of viewership and the, around the rest of the country. So it's this weird focused video channel that is mainly focused on Washington State because that's what I care about. And, um, so because of that, that cross-pollination tends to be a little less interesting for a lot of these other people. But I'm happy and open to do any of that um, if the opportunity presents itself. Um, since Here's a question. Scott, since we don't have the death penalty in Washington, how is it legal to have abortion? Well, it's not hard to answer that question because if you're familiar with people who support abortion, they're going to argue that they aren't killing a life, right? They're just simply evacuating some cells from the body. So that's what their argument is. And so yeah, they don't argue that they're killing a life. Um, the Let's look down here. Um, Michael, uh, do you think we will ever overturn vote by mail in Washington state? Yeah, and the answer to that actually is I think we could. There's a couple different ways that vote by mail ends up um, going away. And I got a feeling that we're 
again, as this crescendo of chaos and other problems kind of keeps rising to the level, um, it isn't the. It isn't always. A lot of people want uh, and live in a world in which the the outcome's always bad, right? So they're always prepping for the end of time. And therefore, there's kind of this sense of that that it's always the end of time. But yet, um, there are you know many generations of people that have passed away thinking that it was going to be the end of the world. That they lived in that very final generation, and they were wrong. Uh, and they weren't stupid people always. That's just how they thought. And so it's very common for people to believe that the time they're living in is the most unique time in human history because after all it's that's when you're alive right so that's when people tend to think of it so the vote by mail system could go away in washington state there's a couple things that would make it go away one is a federal issue as it relates to some of the scandals that have occurred in other states that are making vote by mail illegal and at some point in time there's going to have to be this logic and reconciliation between states that refuse to have it and states that are exclusively set up under vote by mail. Second thing is that vote by mail depends on a functioning post office, which if anybody's been paying attention to how the post office is operating now, um, you'll realize that the post office is functionally collapsing as an entity. Uh, I've been interviewing a lot of postal workers over the last couple of years, and the whole system's crashing there just functionally within their uh, operation. And it's actually pretty bad. I, I uh, was surprised actually how dysfunctional it's become. And there's a lot of reasons why, and, but essentially uh, vote by mail does depend on a functioning post office. And if the post office starts to go down, that's where that's another reason why vote by mail could be a problem. The final part is where I think the um, risk factor for vote by mail, people that support it, is that if you have some communities that decide to go for in-person voting and they start to go back to that kind of a system demonstrating that it – uh, produces results quicker, more accurate, um, more transparent, more obvious what the results are going to be. Um, that starts to push back against this desire to push it everywhere. There's a reason why Washington State in 2011 essentially moved in and shut Pierce County down from having vote uh, voting at precincts, which they were doing. They still had in-person voting uh, as late as 2011. And the state changed it, and it was Pierce County that was the final holdout. It was actually the Republican counties that went to vote by mail first. But Pierce County, which at that time was not that Republican, was pushing, uh, still had these in-person precincts. And they were still sticking to that until the state made it illegal because the only way vote by mail ultimately works is that they're trying to prevent it from being an option. They want it to be the only way you can do it. And um, we'll just have to have a big enough scandal that eventually um, makes that change. The other way vote by mail totally goes away is if uh, Republicans win a bunch of races, and then suddenly the Democrats will decide that vote by mail is a bad idea. Um, Jason, you got a question. What's your thoughts on Washington's uh, Supreme Court upholding Inslee on the rent control? Um, yeah, that was a terrible decision. Actually, I thought that came – was that the one that came out of Spokane? It might have been. Um, that's a terrible – idea, because essentially what they were saying in that decision the Supreme Court had is that Inslee didn't violate the law by basically preventing landlords from being able to get rent over the during the COVID, using the COVID um, uh, example. And it's a complete disaster. Um, but there's other bad decisions that they've come up with. It doesn't mean things are lost. What it means is that things are going poorly. And I do think that if you plan to solve your problems by going to court, um, you're most likely going to be disappointed. Uh, most problems ultimately are going to be political, and you just need to get more engaged in, in doing that. Um, the I Am Lord, uh, you're asking about if I've read a book, Synagogue of Satan. It's a free PDF. Nope, haven't read it, haven't even heard of it before. Um, let's see. Uh, yep, somebody out, out here saying, I watch because I'm a Washingtonian, born and raised, but I moved to the South, but in my heart, Washington is home. Come on back. We'll fix some of these problems, and we'd love to see um, uh, love to see you back in Washington. So um, my daughter just went down to Texas recently for a little while down in Houston, and she was talking about how hot it was and how much more comfortable she was when she came home. Which is funny. Uh, I've traveled around the country a lot, and I I love Washington. Wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Um, there's a question here from Alia. Are you thinking of becoming governor of the state of Washington? Nope, I am not. So I'm not at all. And I, I actually, um, I don't have a, a, a personal desire to run for public office really right now. And the reason is, is I believe that I can accomplish a lot more doing what I'm doing. Um, have the ability to interact with a lot of people who are elected to office, uh, both good and bad. 
Um, and I believe I have more influence from the outside. I have the ability, I think, to influence the outcome and the trajectory of where things are going better from the outside. And I think I fill a role that is a lot harder to fill than a politician. Um, the only time that I think I would go work for government, and I've said this before on my show, but I'll say it again, the time that I would come work for government is if we get a good governor in there, a Republican most likely, and then they want to hire somebody to chop the government down, uh, to downsize government. Um, that's a job that I would do well. Um, I would thrive in that position. Uh, there's a lot of agencies that need to go away. There's a lot of divisions within agencies that need to be go away and restructured. There's a lot of senior level bureaucrats in particular should be fired. Um, there's just some downsizing that we need in government. Smaller the government, the more freedom would be there. And I think it's important to at least to know there's going to be some path to get there. Here's the problem. There's a lot of people, particularly on the conservative Republican side, Ronald Reagan, for example, when he ran for office, he, he ran on this platform originally in 1980 that, hey, we got to downsize government, right? And what, what happened was he got in there, and you can read several stories. There's several books that were written about this at the time where they suddenly got in and you get caught up in the drama of... Uh, dealing with the Department of Education and making it run better, right? Or, or caught up in the drama of the Department of Interior and all the crazy stuff that happened them as they were trying to make some fixes there. And you start to realize that getting bogged down in the bureaucracy and then the inner, um, the squabbles that are involved in that oftentimes distract you from the primary objective, which at some point in time is you just need to end the agency or you need to make sure that you aggressively get rid of a lot of these people in, um, who are in charge. I, I don't know any other way about um, downsizing government other than just really genuinely shutting down um, a lot of these other agencies. So somebody has to be willing to do that. And to do it well, I think you have to study government and understand how it operates and which, what these agencies are, who the divisions are, who actually works there, and start to build a fairly good perspective on what these, you know, how these entities work. What happens, um, the, one of the problems that with that whole process is that mostly conservatives and uh, sometimes Republicans, but, but true conservatives, they, they really don't like government. So what happens is if you're a true conservative, you don't pay attention to how government operates. And if you don't pay attention to how it operates, you really actually don't understand how to shut it down effectively because you don't even know how it works. So you wouldn't know where to start. And it's very simplistic to say, oh, I'm just going to shut down the Department of Ecology, right? But the truth is, when you look at the Department of Ecology, an agency that I've fought with frequently over the years that I generally think that is terribly corrupt and there's all kinds of problems there, um, there's really a, you really have to look at how it's destructured, right, all the different elements to it. There are several different parts. For example, they manage dams, of all things, and the uh, water wells. That's one of the things that they manage. But... Those are natural resources that probably there's some level of supervision that would be acceptable for government, but the Department of Ecology is the wrong agency. Like those things should really be moved to the Department of Natural Resources. But then you have these other departments there that could be completely shut down and go away, and nobody'd ever miss them, and the world would be better off. And it'd be better off if they're removed entirely and the ground is sown with salt and they never come back. So you, but you'd have to break it down systematically, right, and look at the things that would make sense. Um, like the clean air and, and Puget Sound Partnership, right? That whole entity could be shut down tomorrow and every single person there fired and no one would ever notice or miss them. Um, and it would just be $20 million less a year that you need to spend. Well, it's probably more than that now. It's probably getting closer to 40, $40 million less a year that you're wasting on that. Um, anyway, you would have these different agencies and it is really worth it to shut these things down and just completely end them or shrink them, modify them, consolidate. There's a lot of stuff you can do to generally make it better. And it's just important and it has to be done. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question here from Michael. I miss your chats with Jim Walsh. How is he doing? Well, actually, I talked to Jim uh, recently. He is, as you probably know already, the elected chair of the uh, Republican Party for the state, uh, which is a tough job, but he wanted that and people voted him in. I think he's probably going to be one of the best communicators we've ever had in that position. And I uh, I was talking to him out of Moses Lake on Saturday, and it, it just sounds like he's doing a good job. He's jumping in. The advantage, I think, with Walsh, one of the advantages I think that the state probably has for the Republicans anyway, and him getting in that position is that he's 
he knew exactly the job that he's getting into because he used to be the vice chair at the state level years ago before he ran for the legislature. He's had a lot of experience uh, in the legislative level anyway, seeing the political process from a lot of different perspectives. And so it's exciting to see somebody like that step in and be willing to take that position. It's a tough position. So um, anyway, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Maybe I should have Jim Walsh here on the air and I can uh, grill him about the Republican Party now that he's the chair and uh, talk to him about it and see what's, uh, see what's, what's going on. Um, Jason, you got a question here. Do you see anything being done about home invasions and violent assaults being committed against people? Well, when you're saying anything done, I mean, uh, obviously, if you're armed and somebody's invading your house, uh, obviously, um, that's probably something that you're, you know, you're going to want to defend yourself. Uh, home invasions, historically in America, aren't a very uh, good path for criminals to take if they have any desire to live very long. And the reason for that is, I, I just, like, I know where I live in South Thurston County. I... I actually don't know a single person anywhere where I live, hundreds and hundreds of people that I know of who don't have firearms at home. So, um, I mean, nobody. I don't know anyone that doesn't have a firearm at home. And most of them are pretty w capable of using it and certainly willing to use it if you decide to do a home invasion on them. So it's a great way to end your life if you're feeling like home invasions are a good way that you want to spend your, your uh, criminal career. So it's not really something that you see in our country as much as you see it in places like South Africa or even in South America or Europe, even in some places where they have harder problems with some of the crime. So I, I just don't think that's likely to be an issue as, as big a deal here. I'm, I'm a little more concerned about just the, the violent crime that we're seeing out in the community um, that's, that can be random or even targeted, you know, large theft rings, um, the, the decay of society that that crime tends to produce. It's nothing like what I saw when I lived in New York back as a college student in the early 90s. And that's something, again, I think that people don't realize um, that we have had bad crime in our country before, substantially worse than anything that you're seeing today, statistically in every measurable way worse. Um, and look at the crime stats. They still public. I think they're still out there that the FBI had in New York City. And I lived there during the worst of it, uh, when there were 2,200 people murdered a year within my just short distance from my dorm room. And the just the lawlessness that existed at that time. And what had happened is I think over the years it had just grown to become an accepted lifestyle, but eventually it reached the point where people were upset and they did elect Giuliani to come in and make a difference. I think people are basically um, not understanding just how uh, bad crime can get and people will tolerate it. What we're seeing happen right now is instead of, I think, that gradual crime increase that occurred back then uh, from, it really started in the mid-60s and it kind of it, it, it escalated, but it grew over the 60s and 70s into the 80s and into the early 90s. There was a big pushback that started in America in the 80s, right? And I think that did lead to just different election outcomes in the 90s, the 94 election. Crime, if you look back on it, was a big part of the political turmoil going on in the country at the time. Um, what's happening right now is there have been people who have been mostly the last 20 years, you just haven't lived through that type of crime, 20 or 30 years even. So if you haven't ever seen it before, now to see the change, right, the Seattle change of crime, the, the King County crime change compared to where it was before, it's bad. And, and you notice it and you see this decay in a way that probably is different than most people. So um, I suspect that, um, that that's uh, that type of thing is going to be what changes uh, the country a little bit more than, than pe people will rebel against that, and they're not going to like it. And that's the type of crime that, you know, when, when you're having random crime or being held up out there, carjackings, things like that. Um, I don't know if I missed it. Can anything be filed to prevent the election lady from shredding documents since records requests is a no? This is AB with that question. I'm assuming when you write that, question, you're talking about King County elections. And the answer is yes, actually, there's a number of different things that can be done to prevent them from both shredding the documents and hiding the truth. 
And the records requests um, that have already been filed actually have produced um, a fairly decent trail for some other stories. I haven't gone into all those details yet, but I think I'm going to at some point when I feel like we've got enough detail there. But um, there's, uh, they could be, you can get a, you could actually prevent those records from being shredded. The intervention right now of the state Republican Party into that situation and the um, Secretary of State's kind of waffling on it um, is kind of leading to an interesting story. I don't, I don't know where it's going to go, but there's a lot going on. Um, Pamela, thank you for going to the City of Tumwater event tonight, uh, where they have 250, it looks like 250, $25 million uh, consent calendar spending. Yeah, get involved in that. Uh, these guys are blowing money uh, right and left. Um, there's, uh, let's see. One quarter, quarter of, okay, quarter of a million, sorry. Um, Pamela, I saw your other comment down below. The, um, pay attention to local government. I mean, the, I think this is one thing I try to talk about with, when I'm doing activism training around the state, that there tends to be an obsession with what's going on in DC. And, and we should be obsessed in the sense that we're paying attention to just how bad the clown show is out there. But at some point in time, our individual ability to influence DC is uh, watered down quite a bit, especially when you live in a place like Washington, which is 3,000 miles away, and we're considered kind of the backwater of, of America. And so what I think happens is that we have this tendency to, to still obsess about it because that's what the news uh, talks about. And I suspect that um, um, the uh, obsession with DC, with DC and what goes on in DC by both the traditional and the non-traditional media is because that's how you're going to get the most traffic to your website. And I do stories about Washington State that limits the scap, uh, scope of the number of people that probably be interested in this video or this live stream, for example. So, um, but most of us, it, or most content creators or something, if they're out there, they're going to try to do stories that are nationally focused because that generates more interest and more attention and more traffic. And so people are going to be more caught up. They're more likely to develop a following at a national scale. Uh, it's the difference between having a Rush Limbaugh show, right, and or somebody that's more focused at a local level. You're just not going to have the same kind of um, size potential for your what you're doing. So because of that, people tend to be focused on this national obsession about what's going on with Trump, what's going on in D.C., and um, what's going on in Congress, and whatever, what's, you know, the uh, challenging the speakership, or pulling a fire alarm, or whatever the stories are. And some of those stories are great to tell, and somebody needs to tell them, but there's probably a thousand people writing articles about that. What I think gets lost in this mix is that where your life is most directly affected by governments, right, where you live, whether or not it's going to be police, the roads are going to work, the bridge is going to collapse, uh, the schools function in some way, or all, all the, your power grid stays up, most of that's affected by local government. That's the stuff that really is how you live your day-to-day -day life. I mean, those are the things that are affecting you more than anything else. And um, if you don't pay attention to that, you could have everything go great in D.C. and still go crazy and downhill where you live. And on the other hand, if D.C. got nuked tomorrow after the celebrations are over, um, you would just be able to get up every day and uh, you would, the police would still show up if, if you needed them, the ambulance service would still show up, the roads would be fine, the power grid stays okay. You would hardly notice if D.C. disappeared tomorrow, most people. So I think that's very important to remember and paying attention to how your local government works is very, very critical. So you just have to get out there and get more engaged and involved. But I think most people have not wanted to do that. I think there's been a tendency that we all have. Government is going to be put on a, like an autopilot. And I think that a couple generations ago, there was a tendency for people to think that because it was on autopilot, um, that they wouldn't, um, that they didn't have to be engaged, right? That they could just go home and ignore it and take the kids to soccer games, go to work, pay the taxes, and all would be well. And that's never been true. And so that self-deception that I think a lot of people have kind of engaged in, um, now it, it becomes exposed. And you're going to find your ability to influence what happens in local government to be much easier and much more likely than your ability to influence what happens in D.C. And frankly, if you get enough influence in local government, enough places around the country, your ability to operate or to change D.C. is much better. So 
I just think that there's a lot of um, value in teaching people to get more engaged and involved. And I'm actually going to be trying to do a lot more of that. I've, I've been starting to do some training programs and just stay focused on a lot of this. It's very, very important that we have activists who understand effective um, tasks and tactics and strategies they can take locally to change the direction of how government's going in the local community. It's very, very important. Uh, and uh, we're it's necessary. We're going to need to know how to do it, no matter what happens. Uh, if this, the, even if the feds destroy the country with their out of control budget, somehow you have to rebuild, and you might as well be more engaged and involved locally uh, from the beginning to make sure that um, you at least have a functioning uh, court system or a functioning uh, maybe with new judges, and or a functioning law enforcement uh, system. You need to be able to do something. Um, to make life a little bit better locally. And if you aren't paying attention to it, it won't matter what happens in D.C. because uh, they're not going to just fix it remotely for you. Um, there's, yeah, government screws everything up. Hey, don't rock. I don't have any argument to that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, that, okay, it's Scott Scoot, I think is what that is. Is it okay that support LGBTQ people? I don't even know what you're asking there. Um is it, uh, are you asking me, is it okay to be gay? Is that what you're actually saying there? Um, uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, you sh here's a question from Julie. You should do PCO training. Um, what's out there is dismal. Yeah, actually, although I'm gonna tell you, there was, there is a guy doing pretty good, probably some of the best PCO training that I've seen lately. PCO training is one thing. That tends to be more focused on, um, that tends to be more focused on um, party building, right? So for a political party. And I don't know that, I think it's more, it's, if you want to be engaged in um, what happens to your local government, being a P, I'm a PCO, so I mean, being involved, I believe in that. But it's not the only thing. And you can expend a tremendous amount of energy in party, party politics stuff and still achieve very little in your community. I think you have to stay focused uh, and really pay attention to what's happening in your fire district, in your school district, in your city council, in your county commission, with your sheriff, with your auditor, with your treasurer, with your assessor, um, with your legislator, right, with what's happening in Olympia. Stay really focused on that. It is not all about parties. Um, you can, uh, in our state, you can elect a Republican, and they can be terrible. Uh, just because a Republican doesn't um, exempt them from uh, not doing the right thing. Every now and then, I used to say you could elect a Democrat and they could be okay, but that's very rare now. Uh, the Democrat Party seems to be much more aggressive at filtering out anybody that believes in math um, or rational thought. So I'm not sure that you're going to have very, but you might have some leftover Democrats who have been there a while who still are, who are actually semi-rational at the local level, and the Democrats haven't purged them yet. You really have to look at it one by one. How do you get to know the, how these people are doing? Well, you're going to have to pay attention to them. You're going to have to go show up. You're going to have to actually go there and pay attention. If you attend three city council meetings in a row, you your knowledge is going to be ahead of about 99% of the people in your community as to what's actually going on with at least that local jurisdiction. And um, I think that's very important to do that. Um, and if you start to do that, that's going to start to give you the information you need to understand how to make changes. Um, it's going to give you the information you need to understand where some of the problems are, where the likely buckets of corruption are, who's getting the grants, where the grant grifting operations are running, how much money they're losing or missing, who's not paying attention to what, how corrupt the bureaucrats are and what games are they playing, uh, is your sheriff an honest guy, um, is your prosecutor actually prosecuting criminals. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can get, but you've got to get out there and be involved and engaged. You can't sit back behind a keyboard and actually expect to understand or solve the, or even even know what's happening in your community. So you have to get out there and get involved. Um, the, uh, there's a question Jason has, what crazy things will they try to pass next year in Olympia? Um, and this is not a bad question, I think, to kind of um, uh, discuss here. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, Jack had a, had a comment here about, look at what California's passing. Probably it's not a bad idea to look at California. But uh, for ideas, because the Democrats in Olympia are rarely going to come up with a unique idea. Uh, and right now, they're nominally in charge. 
I'm gonna say that based on a number of things that are going on right now, usually the short session, which is what we're going into, is not the session that they do crazy stuff as much. Um, if they try to do something crazy, usually they would try to, they being the Democrats, would try to do something that um, uh, would galvanize their base. And so usually that's gonna be something around abortion or some, uh, some other environmental thing, probably. It'd be something along those lines. And um, they've already bought off the, the billionaires that tend to be involved in a couple of their, the pet projects that billionaires like to support, uh, taking away your guns, um, giving themselves special deals, um, hard, hurting people in some other way. Those, they've already either done that or they don't really want to solve those issues uh, because that would cut their money supply off. So mostly it's going to be a lot of posturing in Olympia. Um, they will they be in Washington State still going to look like it has a pretty good budget. So I imagine spending the money is usually where most of the time is really spent. There's a lot of distractions in Olympia. When the legislature comes up and the Democrats, there'll be a number of Democrats that propose a bunch of really stupid bills that go nowhere. They'll just be, they're proposed so that they can get some clickbait on their side, no intention really of pushing the bill through. And so, and the Republicans will expose them, I'll expose them, right? We'll all expose the really dumb bills that they put up there. But a lot of those probably aren't going anywhere. The challenge is going to be for um, most of our freedoms get lost, not because of some spectacular stupid bill that they propose. Most of our freedoms are lost because of little boring bills that never make the headlines that have another little slice of your freedom taken away in some little place. And it may not even apply to you or you may not think it applies to you, but they're slicing somebody's freedom away just that little bit more, just that little bit more by you know the 500 bills they pass. And those are the things that really cumulatively add up. And it's hard to go back and point out that bill took my freedom away. Most of the time, or that bill made it so it's unaffordable for me to live here anymore. It's very hard to find that. Sometimes you have things like the um, carbon tax, right, that, that are very obvious that it destroys uh, uh, your income, but a lot of things are not. And so, that, that slice and move and slice and move, those are the things that uh, really do start to hurt uh, where, you're, where you're going. Um, Jason, yeah, that Oregon, hat, you have that ballot measure down there um, banning hunting and fishing. Well, well, I'll tell you what, the people who are running the hunting and fishing, the, the fish and wildlife today are terrible. So they need to really clean up that, uh, some of their upper management there and, and address that in Washington State because they certainly have that attitude. Um, States have done that, have gone down that road before where they're essentially banning hunting, not so much fishing, but hunting for sure. And it's usually not worked out well for them. And usually they end up bringing it back. The interesting thing is we have more hunters now in Washington than we did a few years ago. COVID tended to, was the, actually the motivator, got a lot more people hunting than had been. It was kind of already on a decline uh, and COVID kind of kicked it in to gear again. Um, you know, be eternally vigilant on this stuff. Um, there's a lot of dumb ideas that uh, can't be sustained, and yet people will probably propose dumb ideas. And um, and they need a lot of ignorance to do it. But um, anyway, that's um, that's the one of the issues that, uh, that are out there. Gosh, there's a lot of other comments, guys, that are popping up on this that have nothing to do with questions here, but uh, I think they're just kind of uh, random. Uh, things that, that are basically being pushed uh, back and forth. So with that, I've been doing this for about an hour. Uh, I usually try to keep these down to an hour, so today I don't think I'll make any exception to that. Uh, if I'm going to see you out in Port Townsend uh, this coming up uh, Saturday, please come up and say hi. Uh, that way I'll know you're watching the live stream. I'm always wondering who watches these so much. And uh, so it's good to, uh, it'll be good to see you in person. If you're going to be at next Tuesday's Todd Herman show up in Bothell, might see you there. Uh, and uh, again, if you're out in San Juan County or Chelan County, I might see you there the following weekend. Uh, lots of other activities and events going on, but those are just some that stick in the, that are kind of top of mind. Next week, I'm likely to do the live stream on Monday because I'll be at this Todd Herman show. So the, the live stream next week will be on a Monday. Uh, I'm generally trying to do these now at 5.30, purely from selfish reasons because I want to get home afterwards. So um, it's it just lets me have time enough to drive home from the studio. Um, oh, Jason, you had a question here. Yes, there's a ballot measure to repeal the carbon tax. And uh, that wouldn't be voted on, though, until next year, uh, November 2024, because it's going to the um, uh, legislature. So um, anyway... Um, 
<laughs> yeah, Rock, you got a question, can the government fix the government? No, it can't, but people can come in and fix it. And part of fixing it is downsizing it. There is no other option. You have to downsize it. Um, so anyway, um, it's, it's very important to uh, stay engaged, and I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you out there. I'm hoping to talk about some of the projects um, as they produce more results on some of the training sessions that I'm doing with, with activists from around the state. So I do, uh, uh, and I'm gonna, I'll have to give another update. I have, didn't really talk about tonight, but uh, an update on the public disclosure complaints that I filed. Some of those are starting to be processed. Um, I'm anticipating dropping another 50 or so, give or take. I've got a bunch more um, that I've done some research on and, and I've just been busy with some other things. I, I think you're gonna see um, an upgrade to my website for too long. And, uh, but also I, I'm trying to do a lot more stuff in the field. I like that, I like meeting people. Um, this is an unusual environment where I'm doing a live stream. I don't see you, I'm seeing your comments, but I, I tend to interact better just seeing people in person. So I always like to, to, to see you if I can. So uh, with that, uh, I think I'm gonna close this out. And uh, let me know if you guys like this different uh, camera view. Um, this kind of gives you just a sense of the studio and uh, what it looks like um, from back there. So you kind of get a sense of what this is like here. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how this is working right now for live stream. And this is kind of the same place where I do a lot of my um, video, uh, video editing. So with that, guys, uh, be safe out there uh, and uh, drive safe and uh, keep your head on a swivel. And again, be involved in local government. Take care of your family, take care of yourself, but uh, stay engaged in your community and uh, make find other like-minded people to do so as well. Because like I say always, the future belongs to those who show up and you need to show up to make a difference. So we'll see you next week. And uh, thank you for watching.